or that it's being recorded. Uh, I want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have questions or you adamantly disagree with something that I'm saying, let me know. We're all here to learn, like this whole conference this week. So uh, please, let's talk about it. I, I want to I touch today on, I know there's people are talking about cloud here. How does this look? Uh, different types of infrastructure. I really want to focus in on what, what is called converged infrastructure and where that fits in the market and kind of how people are uh, using converged infrastructure and for what they're using it for today. Because I think there's a really unique use case um, that's really important. Uh, while I'm busy doing architecture and design work, I also uh, have been involved with uh, virtualization community for some time. So I was er early on um, a um, active participant in the VMware community. Uh, I cut my teeth years ago with Solaris containers, actually is how I kind of moved into virtualization and then from there fell into VMware land uh, 10 years ago with everyone else that kind of uh, happened to go that way. Um, and I've been working around with, uh, working around and working with open source projects and different types of solutions uh, since. Um, where they fit and how they fit into different, different pieces. Um, I work with uh, one of the founders of VM Underground, which is a completely user-driven event that happens every year prior to VMworld, which is interesting. Um, that's the for fun and parties. Uh, you can find me on Freenode. I'm there usually uh, on the internet, but mostly I'm making tons of noise or being noisy on Twitter. Um, So if you have a white field, or if you have a green field, it, it, it's, it's sort of a unique environment, right? Like those don't exist today, I don't think, in very many places. Um, so as we start trying to figure out how we evolve our infrastructure from the way that it's looked for the last, we'll say, 15 years, we really have to sort of like take into account all of the things um, of what we're trying to do. How do you plan for elastic workloads? That's huge, right? As companies start talking about so an interesting antidote was uh, VMworld this year. VMware is the guy's on stage. He's talking about all of VMware's products and this huge what's amazing and what's cool. And one of the slides comes up, and it's next generation application stacks and why VMware is best for next generation application stacks. All of the next generation application stacks, all of them, 100%, were all open source projects. They weren't products. They were open source projects. That is where the industry is moving. As we start evolving how applications are written, they are being written differently to be hosted on cloud-style application layers, right? Which is scale out, no single points of failure. You can have infrastructure plug and play. The problem is, is we have existing workloads. Not only do we have uh, physical workloads today that need to be virtualized still, we have what I lovingly refer to as legacy virtualization workloads, which is anything that was migrated to a VM any time in the last 10 years, right? Those are legacy virtualization workloads. Because now that they're easy to manage, and now that they're in a VM, no one's patching them, no one's doing anything with them, and no one is encouraged to migrate those things. And if you are patching them, those operating systems that are on, I infrequently see those operating systems being upgraded. At some point in the life cycle of those operating systems, they turn into appliances or virtual appliances or try to harden them to a virtual appliance. But that code base is still like fractured because it's still in a container running on top of a hypervisor, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And then we can't really do anything about the last one. You have inertia in place. You have architecture in place. You have hardware in place. You have people in place that like working with product X or product Y, uh, a network design or an architecture that was put in place years ago. All of these things are sort of like there already. So how do you tackle these things? What is the problem we're trying to solve? Uh, I guess from, from my perspective, the, the main thing to start with is as we're walking around, there are a lot of different cloud solutions that are doing interesting things, right? Um, and so as you start looking at, okay, I've got this environment and I want to layer on cloud to try to start solving my infrastructure challenges or how do I grow in my infrastructure? How do I move these things away? Can't we just use this product? Can't we just use this project? Can't we just dump this on top? And that could be OpenStack. That could be CloudStack. That could be pick anybody. It doesn't matter. There's an assumption that I can layer on some sort of 
cloud application layer onto my existing infrastructure and fix my problems that I have, that I have going on today. Storage IO challenges, network design and architecture challenges. If I just layer on this cloud product on top of this, I can move my workloads into this and it's gonna fix things. And that's sort of a scary problem. And, and it's, it's amplified by the fact that the language that we use to describe these products is ambiguous, right? Even in a, if you just look at the word cloud, right? How we're, how we're trying to discuss this, it, it creates a ton of challenges for us because they don't do the same things. Projects like OpenStack and projects like CloudStack, while they appear similar on the surface, actually tackle things in a very, very different way. So sort of baselining the conversation, um, since it is sort of murky. Um, Legacy enterprise workloads is stock, lock, stock, and barrel enterprise virtualization, right? That is, I take a VM. There's the whole pets cattle. Everyone's heard it. Everyone in this room, I'm sure, has heard it. Um, if a VM is going to die and you actually care and you spend any amount of time trying to repair that VM, that VM belongs in your enterprise virtualization environment, period. <laughs> if that VM dies and you're like, bah, spin up another instance, or even better than that, it's automated, it CI handles it and you have, you know, your environment spins up another instance for you, that belongs in your cloud infrastructure environment. They're not the same, right? Um, this on the right is a picture of Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. Um, it looks like vSphere. It, this is any, any type of environment if you're familiar with what that looks like. Uh, it, it's your traditional hypervisor attached on the back end to a large storage array with the networks on the front end and VMs are running. and. If this, e if this ESX host, I mean KVM host, dies, right, or Zen host dies, right, it doesn't matter, they're all the same at this point. If that node dies, another hypervisor says, hey, that VM's supposed to be running, and it turns that VM, VM on on another ESX, I mean KVM, I mean Zen server host, right? They all spin up the same way, they do the same types of things. Um, and then you have some management portal and stuff like that. But even in the definitions, we start seeing things that are different, and we start seeing things that have to be keenly identified on. Resource pooling, on-demand, self-service, rapid elasticity uh, versus maximum server utilization, minimum server count, right? Those are two, one is really focused on like maximizing hardware utilization, and the other one is focused on being able to scale out your applications. Um, different ideas. So if we have a good idea around what that sort of legacy enterprise virtualization workloads look like, everyone is kind of, is there anyone that hasn't seen this slide? Like I give this, I've given a similar talk to this at different places and like this slide is everywhere now. This is really important. This is Elastic Cloud, right? Like the thing about OpenStack to me that's most interesting is what it actually is there to do well not what people are trying to shoehorn it in to do. And that's something that's very important. As you start designing at data center scale, you wanna make sure that you're leveraging applications to do what they do well, not trying to force them. If anyone's trying to do HA on OpenStack today, and I know this is gonna cause heartburn, you're doing it wrong, right? Like you shouldn't have to worry about HA workloads running in OpenStack today, because you shouldn't care where those things live. Um, but that infrastructure at scale facilitates elastic workloads to be run very well, right? So everyone, is, everyone here should be familiar, semi-familiar with this slide. So this is from The Godfather, right? This is probably, I see this is probably one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Mario Puzo is the guy that wrote The Godfather. He's not, that's not who that is actually, but that's his quote. Um, and, and I think this is applicable, right? Everyone needs to like hammer this home. I usually would ask, everyone's kind of early for this. If it was after lunch, we would stand up and say it out loud. Like elastic cloud and enterprise virtualization are oil and water, right? They don't belong on the same framework. There's no point in having them on the same framework. You could put them on the same framework, but they don't need the same things, right? It's like you could put 50 screaming children in a station wagon if you wanted to, but let's put them on a bus. Let's do something different. Um, so that's something that we try to focus in on. So now we have an idea of how we're describing enterprise virtualization and how we're describing commodity cloud or elastic cloud. And there's, this is the challenge, right? Like if we look at enterprise 
virtualization, legacy virtualization workloads, and how that looks with converged infrastructure. It hasn't changed since it came out, right? Zen server, Red Hat Enterprise virtualization, uh, VMware, vSphere, it has looked like this since it got released. None of this has changed, right? This diagram, it doesn't matter. The reason that this is, so one is I have horrible skills in making graphics. So there's, there's that layer. We're going to add that. But, but honestly, this doesn't matter what I'm talking about. It's applicable to all three of those. Because this is what enterprise virtualization looks like today, right? But we can do cool things. And we sort of get this sort of additional layer, right? Just that idea of live migration, just the like, fact that that's tweaked in and every, Hyper-V, everybody's doing this idea now, that vMotion or live migration between commodity compute environments changed everything. So if you roll back, was 10 years now, 10 years ago roughly, when vMotion was introduced by VMware and everyone's doing it now? That changed everything. If I was an operations guy sitting in a data center, I didn't have to get up at 2 o'clock in the morning to go power cycle a server. I could do it in the middle of the day when I'm fresh, when I you know, have time. I vMotion that VM maybe at 2 o'clock in the morning when I didn't trust it, when it was still new. But I can do hardware maintenance in the middle of the day. That changed everything for an operations team. Just the ability to migrate that workload live, everything changed. It's pretty cool, right? Um, we have this problem. It's kind of the problem I want to talk about, actually, as we, as we start talking about what the next step is for enterprise virtualization. This hasn't changed down here. This layer hasn't changed. We're still limited by what's going on down here, below the commodity compute environment. But we did gain all these things, right? I mean, how we look at all of this stuff is, has changed. It's, this is actually pretty, pretty interesting. Again, that same idea of being able to migrate a workload impacted all of these things for customers. But we think about what was underneath that layer. What was underneath that vMotion layer, underneath that commodity compute layer, it hasn't changed for a really, really long time. It doesn't matter how much cool stuff you layer in on top, how much cool functionality you can build into your hypervisor and the functionality that you're doing for your commodity compute environments. Not, it, it is important, but you're not maximizing what you can do if your storage architecture it still looks and smells like it did 20 plus years ago. If I still have a SAN cable plugged into a two node head and I'm worried about how many IOPS I can deliver through a single, you know, you're, you're tackling the same problem. That's been tackled a thousand different ways. Sometimes you're really limited by what's underneath, right? So come back, coming, coming back to that. If you were going to design an infrastructure today, right now, to fix the idea of converged infrastructure, or fix the idea of how does, what can I do different in enterprise virtualization? How can I kind of move the ball forward for legacy enterprise virtualization, realizing that everyone is focused on the cloud today, and this is a problem that isn't terribly exciting? I think it's exciting, because there's a lot of virtualized workloads that need some TLC. If I, if I was going to try to tackle that bottom tier layer of how do I fix this? How do I move the ball forward? This is what needs to happen, right? We need to have something that is a single storage solution that is visible for SAN, is visible for file share, and is visible for object store, right? We, under, we know where things are going. We know where the future is going. So if we're going to fix this problem for converged infrastructure, we need to tackle it with an eye towards the future as well. So we need to have something that's file system aware. We need to be able to push everything into a single namespace. We understand APIs are important. We want to have an API that we can code against so that we can automate this thing and not have to deal with it. I don't want, I don't want to have to get up if something on my storage breaks. I don't want to have to deal with it. I want it to take care of itself. Right? I want to be programmatically tackling problems instead of trying to like turn wrenches. Um, we need to clearly identify interface points in the virtualization stack. That is probably, to me, the biggest one. And that brings us right back around to the start of this thing, this converged infrastructure. 
What is convergent infrastructure? That's Wikipedia. Coming back to my lovely PowerPoint skills. This is what convergent infrastructure summed up is to me. We have this today, right? This hypervisor inserting this, inserting this shim above the commodity compute layer. Think of all of the things that changed. And think about all of this zoo that we have down below that's still the same. It still looks, I mean, this doesn't pick a vendor, right? I mean, you've, we've got different vendors in here. This looks like everything, everything looks like this. It doesn't matter. NetApp, EMC, IBM, HP, Dell, pick a vendor, right? What if we just get rid of that? We get rid of those, those heads that are attached to that disk. We really care about the disk. We don't necessarily care about the way that they're attached. What if we just get rid of that layer? Well, we've got to move it somewhere. What if we take that shared storage and shove it up right next to the hypervisor, potentially running alongside the hypervisor? What does that, what does that change? What can we do? I don't even know, right? I mean, I, I, I build out infrastructure that does some of this, and I'm seeing some things and some added benefit that I get by deploying this way. But by moving our shared storage above the commodity compute layer and leveraging disk and chassis in some sort of file system that is striped or redundant across the multiple nodes, you can standardize your hardware platforms, and you can do all sorts of crazy things that you couldn't do before when you had a chain down below attached to your storage. And it, traditional fashion. This is interesting. What does this change? Um, that to me is what converged infrastructure is. We're not the first to market, right? Like as a, the free software community, as the Linux community here, we're not like coming up with this idea. No one is going to fall over that this is new. There are other people doing this today already. So we kind of already have a path in front of us of what we can do different. Uh, VMware, Cisco, and EMC created a group called VCE, I'm not sure what the technical name of that is, but they're doing some stuff in the converged infrastructure space. They sell giant racks of gear that they push out as a single unit. That's mildly interesting. Sort of converged infrastructure, they call it that. I don't know if I buy it. Dell's doing something that's actually kind of interesting in the same space. And it's kind of close to, it's more interesting than what VCE's doing, but it's similar. Right now, Nutanix, if I'm looking on that market, Nutanix is the company that's doing this well, right? Nutanix is a box, disk and chassis, if you want to buy their product, you go buy it. You drop in 20, 30 of these things. It clusters all of the disks together across all of the boxes, and it runs the hypervisor. That's pretty cool, right? That's pretty awesome. But they're all proprietary. They're all black box. And they actually go so far as to use that in their marketing material, right? Like, that is their graphic. That's their, their stuff, right? That's Nutanix. This is not what we want. This is not where we need to go, right? We're not OK with this. Um, that's a problem, right? But it's a really big, difficult challenge. Um, I think it's a hard problem. I think, I think she thinks it's a hard problem as well. So what do we have to sort of start tackling this? I'm not saying that what I'm talking about or what I'm proposing is like the end goal or the end post. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We need to shift how we think about our infrastructure drastically from a developer community. We need to shift what we're thinking about and how we apply ourselves drastically from a developer community. But we can start looking at tools that are already available today to start thinking about things differently and start looking at infrastructure in a converged way. How do we leverage infrastructure in a converged way? There's some tools that are out there, right? So Overt's interesting. How many people show of hands have ever used Overt before? Got a couple. Anyone? Anyone else over here? No? OK. So I'll take a couple minutes and burn through uh, what Overt is. It's an open source alternative to vCenter and vSphere, right? So Red Hat releases uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, the upstream project for that. The, so everyone's familiar with Red Hat Enterprise Linux, right? So the upstream project for that is Fedora, right? So Fedora feeds down into Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That's how that works. Anyone can go get Fedora for free. They don't care. It's use it what you want, do with it, contribute. If eventually stuff is cool, it get, trickles down into Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Overt and Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization have the same relationship. Over it's the upstream, everyone can contribute, everyone's pushing stuff into it, good things. It trickles down into Red Hat Enterprise virtualization. Um, focuses on KVM only. So this is interesting, right? It only uses KVM. And the reason for that is, and I think I could be completely wrong, um, if you only focused on one hypervisor, it allows you to take advantage of all of the features of a hypervisor and do things differently. If you try to support multiple hypervisors, 
There's other projects that try to support multiple hypervisors. If you try to support multiple hypervisors, you have to have a very low compatibility for all of your stuff, right? You can't take advanced, can't take or leverage advanced features and go deep. You have to stay thin across the top so that all the functionality is the same. So just focusing on KVM allows for Overt to do some really interesting things and take care of every new feature that gets released, um, specifically around uh, KVM, which is cool. Um, Large scale, this is old school style, right? I and mean, this is legacy virtualization workloads, which is fine. It looks the same, right? Uh, there's, I mean, you could rip this out and throw up Zen Server. You could rip this out and throw up vSphere. You could rip this out and throw up whatever you want, right? This is, I am a user. I'm connecting via an HTTP to a web portal. I am logging in. I am talking to an engine or vCenter or Zen Server, right? And it is talking to a hypervisor, which is running things, in this case, QMU, you know, uh, KVM, libvirt, uh, and it is talking out to, again, the black box, right? The old school storage configuration, uh, which has some sort of disk arranged in an IOP configuration that allows for performance for VMs, right? I mean, that's, everyone is, knows how that works. This is how Overt works today. That's cool. It works for us. We can start with that at least, and we're going to change some things. From a storage perspective, it's important to understand it organizes disk and it organizes your IO the same way that a Zen server or a vCenter does, right? In a very, if you're, if you're used to one, you're going to be very familiar with this as well. It's not going to seem all that strange. Um, so your block NFS, POSIX layer, uh, rolls out, disks run on top of it. You get domains that are built out for storage and then you have your, you can do your live migrations within a storage pool between different hypervisors. All of that is very interesting. Um, so we'll start with that. The real challenge at this point, I think, for converged infrastructure, and I think where, as, in, as a group, you know, we think this is cool or we think cloud is cool and we want to work on this project or this project, where we fall over is we lose track of the fact that file systems, while boring, are ridiculously important. And how we tackle storage is also really, really important. Uh, and so we need something, if we're going to layer this together, kind of make a converged infrastructure sandwich. Apparently I'm hungry because I'm thinking about sandwiches. Um, you know, we can use Gluster today. So how many, again, so that was interesting for Overt. So people weren't familiar with that. How many people have used or heard of Gluster? Let's say, let's say you've heard of Gluster, right? Everybody's hands should go up. Uh, how many people have actually used Gluster? Like deployed Gluster for real configs? Less hands come up, but there's a few. Um, it's interesting, right? So Gluster is changing very rapidly. The, la the latest release is, was kind of cool. I was um, at Red Hat at the time, and it was the first time that there was a major feature release that got pushed into Gluster that Red Hat didn't do. Like it came from a partner, which was awesome uh, for lib, the QMU integration stuff, lib GFAPI QMU bits, which we'll talk about in a bit. But anyway, um, that's awesome. So people are outside of Red Hat are contributing upstream to Gluster. We talked about the upstream like Fedora and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And then we talked about Overt and Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization. Gluster is Red Hat Enterprise Storage, right? It's the same thing. So everybody can contribute, do what they want with Gluster and do all their stuff and add and code and contribute. And out the bottom comes Red Hat Enterprise Storage. Um, it's a scale out clustered storage environment. Lots and lots of clients. This is an old graphic, but this is my favorite. They don't really talk about this very much anymore, but you can layer Gluster on top of anything, right? You can put a Gluster, think of it as a, for me, the thing that clicked finally, coming from, like the virtu coming from virtualization land, not really dealing with storage that much, it's a storage hypervisor. It's a storage hypervisor. You can lay it in as a shim between whatever disk you want anywhere and whatever you want it to talk to. It does the same thing that a hypervisor does, but it does it for your storage, for your disk I.O., which is kind of cool. Uh, in this case, on the far left of this graphic is the direct attached disk. That's kind of the key points, right? The direct attached disk piece. It's how it's most commonly used, but sometimes you can throw a SAS cables onto a server and drop out a JBOD behind it, or for if you have a NetApp 2020 or FAS 2020 or a VNX or an HP, whatever, or left hand SAN, you can always attach those and use those disks as well. It just adds the hypervisor, it abstracts that layer away. Linear performance scaling, Gluster.org. So we're kind of going to start 
piecing some things together here for convergent infrastructure. I don't like reading. You all can read, so I'll leave you with that. Um, those are some ideas behind Gluster. It's very important to understand these key differences. Um, where you put the disks, what the disks are, and then the collection of disks. So this is Gluster FS sort of really high level, right? This is I'm logging in, I do the CLI, I do my configuration changes. Here's how I build out a Gluster environment. Here's my cluster between these three servers. I've got all of these Gluster FS daemons running that are managing all of the disks across these boxes. And I've got, oh, look at my graphic is wonky. Uh, you can connect via REST API, NFS, SIFs, you know, all of the different ways that you can connect. But we're not going to do all of that. We're specifically going to change things. And for us, the only way that we're connecting for our converged infrastructure play is with the hypervisor, right? And we're going to use the native Gluster FS connector, which is going to be interesting. Um, where are we at? Three cluster release three two one QA two just came out. I think they just released that yesterday or the day before. Um, back in three one, so so long ago, um, like a, I don't know, a couple months. Uh, cluster um, added in features to allow for interaction with Overt, which is kind of interesting, right? So Overt has always been this: how do you manage your VMs, right? That's what Overt does, and you can build VMs and manage them. Um, but they added in this feature set to allow for you to manage your Gluster environments through Overt as well, which is kind of interesting. So you have the ability through a nice, pretty GUI that you're managing all your VMs in. You have the ability to also build storage arrays and like manage your storage disks and manage your Gluster environments directly through Overt, which is pretty cool. Um, single pane of glass, I think, is the architecture term that they like to use for that. Uh, single pane of glass to see all of it. It's, it's interesting, but more important is the fact that these two tools are already talking, right? So we can start leveraging these two things to move that storage layer north of the commodity compute environment. Uh, also important, there's a VDSM cluster plugin that allows for that to happen. Uh, what does that look like? If I have uh, my storage servers, each of those are the nodes from the previous slide that have all of my disks in them. Um, I'm going to drop out an agent on each of these that's going to talk to the overt engine, which is the vCenter-ish, Zen server center-ish piece in the middle. Um, and then I can manage it either through a Python SDK, which means it's programmable, which is interesting, uh, or through CLI services. And I can take advantage and tie all of this stuff together, which is great. Um, that's pretty self-explanatory. How can I use more Gluster bits? The key thing for me here that's also really important to talk about is if you're doing over in Gluster in this type of arrangement where you have all of your commodity compute layer, um, you can actually directly attach the hypervisors and the storage through one interface, which is kind of cool. Um, there are some challenges to do that, and you want to make sure and start the volumes and optimize them for virtualization workloads. But it allows for you to break this up and push things into that that layer. So we had a show of hands. This is going to, for people that have used Gluster before, this has become sort of odd at this point. Um, there's a GUI, right? So like through Overt, there's this interface that you have to do all of the stuff that you were familiar doing with Gluster before via the command line. You actually have a portal that you can log into and build out all of your hosts, create clusters for Gluster. Um, create your volumes, add your bricks, all of the things for that file system allows you to go through and do all of this and tie all this stuff together through one interface still, which is pretty awesome. So this is where things get really interesting for me and why it gets important. This um, is the, I think it was, IB, was it IBM? I think it was IBM that did the big code contribute for the QMU the GlusterFS natively on the back end. So before, if you'd used Gluster years ago, one of the problems, and it was a valid concern, let's see how many people I can irritate by saying this, um, Gluster's performance wasn't great for VMs, I think is the nicest way to say it. Um, it had some issues, right? Like there were, like if you're mounting up and using, a, I have a Gluster cluster that's built and I'm using NFS, VM performance was potentially problematic. It's probably a nice way of saying it. Um, however, 
This is a large code contribution from IBM that was in the latest release for 3.4. Uh, they, I have a home lab, so I can't really accurately speak to what it does at scale. Red Hat was comfortable saying publicly 200% performance increase, which means that it's probably more than that, if that's their conservative estimates. Um, mine were a lot higher than that by a 2x, which is terrifying. Yeah. The QMU Gluster FS natively in the backend mount? Are you sure? These, I, I would double check. This is a John Mark slide. Yeah. Three, you're thinking overt. Overt's on a 3.2 release. 3.3 is coming out, yes. This is, no, no worries. That's fine. Keep me on my toes. I, had, I actually stopped and I'm like, really? I've given this presentation like three times now, and you're the first person that's caught it. That's terrifying to me. Um, yeah, no. Um, the important thing is, is once this code dump happened, QMU, right? We all know how QMU works. KVM, you can natively talk to GlusterFS, which means it's not talking through Fuse anymore. It was, I had to go through this Fuse, it does this translator, then I can talk to Gluster on the back end. We just took all of that out. QMU natively talks to GlusterFS now, right? That's huge. That's a massive performance gain from a hypervisor perspective. Um, and also, the, uh, if you're doing like data center design, the NFS V3 ACLs, nobody's really talking about this. That's huge if you're trying to do like multi-tenant solutions. You have to have something like that. Otherwise, people get very touchy about how people can see each other's data. So NFS, th the V3 ACLs is pretty solid. 3.4 um, is out. There's, I just think it was 3.4. Two, is it 3421? Now you can, now, now I'm all over the place. GlusterFS 3421, I think, is the latest uh, beta that just came out. And hint, hint, go grab it and start playing with it. It's interesting. Um, the block device support is uh, via the translator, libgf API, is huge. OK, so going, rolling your mind back to that slide where we took the commodity compute layer and shoved it up next to the hypervisor. I think that actually fixes a lot of challenges that people are having in their, in their enterprise today or in their, in their companies or with their customers today from a converged infrastructure story. VMware is moving that way. VMware just released vSAN. Like, all of us should be aware of that. It's actually, that is going to change the industry, the storage industry. I f firmly believe that. There's other companies that have pushed it. But what they released was Gluster. Not really, right? It's their own product. It's doing their own thing. But they released a distributed file system that runs on top of a hypervisor, right? That's what they just released. The industry is moving that way. There's value in that. We need to start thinking about things differently and pushing in the same direction. Um, however, now that we have a converged infrastructure story or play for all of our legacy virtualization workloads, we do realize that all of those next generation applications are coming. What do we do? Right? How, how does this work? Um, I don't actually have to do this anymore. So this was my, when I was, um, when I was at Red Hat, this was my uh, don't talk about things I can't talk about slide. But I, I can safely ignore that slide now. Um, right now today, you can go out and grab RDO. RDO is the not, doesn't, it doesn't stand for Red Hat Distribution of OpenStack. RDO is the upstream release. We talk about upstream, downstream at Red Hat. RDO is the upstream, very similar to Overt, for what will be uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack. Is it, yeah, RHEL OS, I think is what they're calling it. Uh, so that is, uh, RDO is the upstream version of that. So if you think about how that process works, same thing. Fedora, RHEL, RDO, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, OpenStack. Um, you can use Gluster right now, for instance. Or, okay, let's, let's, we talked about Overt and Gluster. How many people are, have, are familiar with what OpenStack is? Everyone should raise their hand. Their marketing is fantastic, right? How many people actually use OpenStack in deployments? Like, how many people have rolled it out? I got one hand in the back. Anyone else? How many people are considering pushing OpenStack out? That's always a good question, too, right? So RDO is actually a really easy way to get moving in that direction if you're interested in OpenStack. Um, there are different chunks of that. There's the objects. From a storage perspective, I don't know why, but I really like boring infrastructure problems like storage. Um, there's an instance store, uh, and there's the cinder block storage and the glance image. These are all different pieces of 
the storage layer that, are, that you need when building out an OpenStack environment. And GlusterFS has different tools to assist in that. Uh, today, you can use um, and deploy Gluster and let it be your object store for the Swift as well. There's a plugin that allows for that interaction so that you can use a Gluster cluster as your Swift object store. Um, also for Cinder and for Gl Glance as well. So that's all available. There's some stuff that's coming. I don't actually have visibility into this anymore. Uh, but that open hybrid cloud is important. This, I don't know what this is, right? Like, I don't know what open hybrid cloud means. I know what I want it to mean. But at some point, I think Red Hat's going to get upset. This is what I want it to mean, right? Like, this is what's important. You can do most of this today. This is actually, with the converged infrastructure story, something that's very easy to do and also critically important to start thinking about, which is, although oil and water, enterprise legacy virtualization does not mix with cloud application workloads, it doesn't mean you can't use the same tools. It doesn't mean that you can't minimize the number of different components in your infrastructure so that you can move forward seamlessly. Right now, today, upstream over, I know it's not in their current, or in, I think it's in the upstream, it's in the, it will be in the new 3.3. Glance is the image repository piece for OpenStack. You can use that today with Overt to manage your image repository as well. So natively inside of Overt, you can just leverage Glance on the back end to manage your images for your legacy virtualization workloads. That does, that's insane, right? That's pretty cool. You can use Gluster on the back end for your storage for Nova or your storage for Overt on the back end. And if you have it up in the commodity compute layer, you can use the same reference architectures as well, hardware reference architectures for these types of deployments. Um, we can use Swift on the back end. Again, across the board, standardizing on KVM, something that I've done, it's terribly easy to do. Different management pieces, the Overt Engine and the Horizon pieces, yeah, there's different portals and different stuff like that. But both of them now today, as of the latest releases as well, upstream can leverage Neutron networking API as well. So if you're using an Open vSwitch implementation, you can leverage the, both of those and plug them right in to either your Overt configuration or your OpenStack configuration, which is kind of cool. Because then your networking layer is the same, your storage layer is the same, your hypervisor configuration is the same, hardware architecture is the same. And while it is oil and water, you can standardize on as many components as possible. This is really important for me. And again, highlighting my massive skill at putting together graphics for slides. It's fantastic. Lots of boxes. Um, so talking a little bit about Glance. Glance is that component layer specifically around uh, image repositories. It's the way that you get images. A Amazon AWS, is anybody using, anyone is using AWS? I'm just because I'm curious now and I feel like raising my hand again. Um, for image repository, how do you move an image or an AMI in and out of either OpenStack or into like something like AWS or you know, their vCloud, VMware, vCloud, they have a portal or a middle ground, a DMZ, if you think about it from that perspective, where you can migrate images in that then get imported into their cloud offering into your catalog or pulled out the same way if you need to download something. That is that piece. So by OpenStack and over upstream natively leveraging Glance, we sort of can take advantage of that at the data center layer and standardize images, which is cool. Um, Being able to migrate is pretty important. Um, and cluster functionality, right? No one builds a data center, <laughs> right? No one builds, this is my one environment in my one office, and it exists on its own, and I never need to move it anywhere, right? Everyone worries about DR replication, um, business continuity plans, so they start building those things into their environments. You want to be able to leverage replication pieces of cluster as well to move your AMIs or your images around, push your images around, and how do you back them up, those types of things. Um, and the networking support. Just realized I've been rambling for some time. Um, the networking support, right? Like how we leverage in our, our Open Daylight Foundation, go stop by their stuff and talk to them. They're doing really interesting things. The important piece here, that's all north of Neutron, right? Like, so if you look at Neutron as an API for OpenStack, uh, that allows v open vSwitch implementations to connect in and plug into Neutron. You also have that layer within Overt as well, so that you can take Overt, actually it comes from the bottom up, and plug into Neutron, and then you can drop in your open vSwitch implementation the same, standardized across both environments. And then your SDN framework can layer in on top of that, which would be your you know, open daylight, or if you're in VMware land, your VNX, VMX, whatever they're calling the company they bought. Um, that's pretty important. 
because again, minimizing pieces means when things break, people actually know how to fix stuff. Uh, you don't have 15 different implementations. So I'm still really active in some of the underlying storage pieces. I still really like and think that storage is one of the biggest challenges today for not only legacy virtualization workloads, but also for like fixing cloud moving forward. There's really, really smart people working all over the place, but uh, from a putting wrenches together and turning wrenches and deploying stuff, we need more people thinking differently about storage. There's tons of people thinking differently uh, industry-wide about, about networking and handling SDN, right? We need to think differently about storage and what that means to move that storage from a base layer, JBOD attached, black box down below, up into that commodity hypervisor, right? How do we move it up next to that? Um, and also thinking about it alongside the hypervisor. That's that's interesting challenge. Get involved, right? Like go do something, go download something, complain about something on IRC, break something, fix something. Just get involved, right? Um, either through Gluster, through the overt environment, uh, or Project X of your choice. Um, storage is something that needs to get fixed, and it and we need to be moving in the right direction together. Um, are those the same slides? Look at that. I don't think I have anything else. Thank you. Um, if anyone has any questions, let me know. This is sort of an interesting problem that needs that we're going to start start tackling from a data center perspective. Um, it sort of disrupts everything, but I think that as an industry, we're starting to move in the right direction. Do we have any questions? How are we on time? Are we okay? Perfect. Perfect. Perhaps not. Yes. Yes, you are. There's one in the back here. Uh, quick question about comparison of Ceph versus sure. ClusterFS. I know, like last year, there was a lot more momentum behind Ceph, but it sounds like I think there still is. I think there's still more momentum. Um, I'm the wrong person to ask, right? Because. <sighs> I really like simple stuff. Like I want, like if you ask me, do I want a stick shift versus an automatic? Like in my heart, I want a manual because I like to grind it and I like to just go after it. But just getting around town, I want an automatic. It's less work, it's less hassle. I can drink coffee and do totally inappropriate things while I'm driving my car and I don't have to worry about making it go faster. That's my analogy between Ceph and Gluster today, right? Like if I package everything into one daemon that runs without a metadata server, Right? And I don't have all these other services. If I just have one service running and I build the environment out, that's Gluster to me, right? It's simpler to me. To me. That's, again, this is my own personal take, right? Other people will say other things. My take is Gluster is solid for what Gluster does, and it came out of sort of an operational background. In other words, some guys, guys like everybody sitting in this room were like, I have a problem, I need to fix it. I'm going to build a service. And they built something and shoved it into operational support and then started fixing it along the way. And it grew out of that. Whereas I think Ceph was sort of this, here is this ethereal problem that I'm trying to solve. And I'm going to write a paper on it, which is awesome. And I'm going to solve it in these ways, which is awesome. And then at some point in the future, I'm going to push it into production. Like I want something production ready today. I know there are multiple petabyte deployments up and running of Gluster. I know that when I read the Ceph documentation, it still says, don't use this file system. Don't use for production environments. I'm sure it's going to get there. It's awesome. It does amazing things, right? For the guy that wants to grind the gears and go through stuff, it's fantastic. And I'm sure that's a horrible analogy. It's not probably not fair. I just really like simplicity, and I like to be able to very quickly and rapidly get stuff up and running. And when I'm doing puppet configurations or puppet manifests and building stuff out, it's less steps for me to integrate and deploy on Gluster and to get Gluster up and running than it is for me to get Ceph up and running. I'm not saying it, one is you know, this or that, I'm just saying, this is this. And it is what it is. And I also like the fact that there's the geo-replication bits are built right into GlusterFS, and I can do geo-replication between data centers without having to buy an additional service. I don't know, last time I looked, I think you have to pay 
externally. Someone's going to yell at me later, I'm sure. I think you have to buy something to do multi-site replication like for production environments with Ceph. I may be wrong. If anyone knows, please tell me. I don't want to be wrong when I say that. That's my, I, I believe that to be true. I know with Gluster, the geo-replication bits are built in, and you can have it out of the box. And everything I'm doing is multi-data center anyway, so I, that's a requirement. Hi. Um, I just got a couple quick uh, points. Um, right now, I've got a combination of Overt and OpenStack installed. Yeah. Doing a semi-migration from one to the other. And I'm considering Gluster. Yeah, yeah I know. OK. Um, I'm considering Gluster um, for the OpenStack side of things. Sure. And um, you know, possibly even doing some of the integration you said with uh, with Nova and the, and the back yeah. end on Overt to kind of make the transition easier. Yep. Uh, quote unquote. Uh, however easy that is going to be. Not Painful, easy. right? Yeah. Uh, bleeding slightly uh, less than before, but still bleeding. Yes. And we're 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 also I'd have to mention we're running three one on a CentOS, which okay. is uh, yeah. So that's yeah. cool. But uh, what what have permanent is that we're, we're running through a one gig pipe. Sure. Which is rather small. 120 VMs sure. in that stack. Bonding. Bond, bond, bond. It's bonded all day long. Okay. Um, and um, so <clears throat> there's things like, uh, and this is one of the things I've been having an issue with, is the performance with uh, iSCSI and um, like HitKit. I was wondering, is there anything, or if you even know, that might be better with Gluster? I mean, do you think I'd see an improvement at all? Yeah, yes. I, and I would say you'd see an improvement with NFS too. Like, I know this, this goes, this is something, this is a person, again, a personal opinion. Like, I, I don't use iSCSI. If I can avoid iSCSI, I avoid it all the time. Again, it comes to that complexity issue. Grabbing a SCSI packet and trying to shove it inside of an IP packet to push it over the wire to have it undo that on the other end, it seems like I, I just, I'm sure it works. I just don't know why to do it. Like, if I have a fiber network, I'm going to use fiber. If I have an IP network, I'm going to use an IP-based protocol, which is the NFS. This is, a, you know, I'm kind of picking up somebody's mess. Sure, 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 yeah. Which is the way it usually is, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right, no green fields. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah, if you have other questions later, I'd love to talk more, too, because I, yeah. Anyone else have anything else? Any other questions? So I'm thinking, I'm counting, in, my, in the back of my head, I'm counting things people are going to light me up for later. So there's iSCSI, and there's Ceph, and there's, there's a few others. Yeah, um... If you guys have questions about this or you have ideas about this, I'll be around. Um, come talk to me. Go talk to Red Hat they, if you want to talk about downstream stuff. Uh, if you're interested in upstream stuff, let me know. Or there's other folks here that are with the upstream uh, Red Hat community as well. So there's plenty of people around. Um, Gluster is ridiculously interesting. There's a Gluster Day event on Thursday as well. So if you're still around hanging out and don't have anything to do on Thursday, go sign up for the Cluster Day. There's different workshops. Uh, shops. I may be talking about how I'm using John Mark doesn't know this yet, but I'll probably be talking about how I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm using, actively using BitTorrent for geo-replication of enterprise storage arrays today, which is kind of interesting. Um, so if you're around and you want something interesting to do, uh, it'll be entertaining. So thanks. <laughs>